Um, also send the slides in the prop channel. Shut up for it. I'm teaching a meeting right now. Go away. I feel sorry for you, children. Sorry about that. That was Ford. He's the leader of uh, DPF prop right now. Uh, he's bothering me. Anyway. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about heat transfer and uh, how to cool our engines. Um, uh, yes, I forgot to delete the um, subtitle from the summer. Um, ignore that. Anyway, yes, we're talking about engine cooling. Um, so first, uh, we're going to cover a little bit of heat transfer, since um, I think most of you haven't taken this class. Um, so basically, uh, energy is a thing. Um, and it's transferred in and out of systems through heat interactions. Um, for us, that's going to be the um, hot combustion flow uh, transfers energy from the combustion into the chamber wall. Um, and uh, so energy always flows from hot to cold, um, you know, from higher energy to lower energy. Uh, that's one of the laws of thermodynamics. Don't remember which one, but uh, it is one. Um, so in uh, mechanical engineering, we represent heat with uh, or heat rate, uh, heat transfer rate um, with lowercase Q or lowercase uh, Q double prime. Um, total heat is represented by a capital Q. Um, so lowercase Q. Uh, is the total uh, heat transfer rate in watts. Um, Q double prime is the heat flux, which is heat transfer rate per unit area. So that's watts per meter squared. Um, this shouldn't actually say, whoops, total heat transfer. This is the total heat transfer rate. Um, total heat transfer would be a capital Q and the unit would be joules. Um, so there are three types of heat uh, interactions um, also notice I'm, I say heat interactions. Uh, I know our heat transfer professor always talks about this, but uh, heat doesn't get transferred. Uh, energy is transferred through a heat interaction. Um, that's just a little semantics that you'll learn when you go through thermo and fluids and heat transfer. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there are three different ways of transferring energy through a heat interaction. There is conduction, which is Basically, you have two objects and the heat kind of just diffuses through the molecules um, and, and energy uh, increases that way. That would be like if you have two pieces of metal, one hot, one cold, and then put them together, um, conduction slowly happens between them until they're both the same temperature. Um, convection is when you have a fluid involved in that. Basically, it's... Um, between a, a fluid interface, whether it's fluid to solid, which is most of what we're going to be dealing, almost all of what we're going to be dealing with, uh, you can technically also have convection between a fluid and a fluid, but we're not going to deal with that. Um, and basically, it's where the motion of the fluid is uh, forcing more heat transfer than um, through just conduction alone. And then radiation is weird. It's basically um, Electromagnetic waves also carry energy and heat can be uh, transferred through that. But we're not going to deal with radiation because radiation is stupid and dumb. And don't ask me about my heat transfer project because it's definitely not about radiation. OK. So uh, now we're going to put that in the context of rocket engines. Um, so as I was saying, hot combustion flow of our combustion products uh, and nozzle exhaust uh, is going to end up creating an immense amount of convective heat transfer into the chamber and nozzle walls. Um, and this has to be dealt with. Um, otherwise, the engine will melt. Um, and there's a very various ways to deal with that. Um, from heat sink to ablative to regenerative and film cooling. 
so heat sink is basically where you just have a large hunk of metal that has a large capacity to uh, conduct heat. And um, basically you kind of just let the, uh, the energy from the combustion flow conduct through the walls and heat up the entire hunk of metal. Um, and so that is a way that has a time limit on how long you can fire the engine since there's no actual way that you're cooling the engine. You just have energy going in to the walls of the chamber and it's not coming out anywhere. So the temperature is gonna rise and you have a, a finite time of how long you can fire the engine before, before it starts melting. Um, so this is the cooling method that was used in the IPA Gox engine. I don't know if, I, I think I should, uh, had pictures of that in a previous PowerPoint, but it, it basically was just a giant cylinder of metal and the, uh, the inside chamber was very small compared to how wide the piece of, of metal was that made the chamber. Um, and yeah, basically just absorbed heat and, um, this is also what we're going to have you guys doing um, in theory uh, right now for next week's uh, session. You're going to be doing math on figuring out how long you can uh, fire a heat sink engine for and figuring out how big uh, it needs to be to absorb all the heat. And then if we are allowed to next semester uh, and to pick one of the designs to actually make, that's how it's going to be cooled. Uh, so the other, uh, another way to cool it that we've used in the past is ablative cooling. Um, this one's kind of hard to describe. So basically you have a material that's uh, on the inside of the chamber, a nozzle that's lining it, that is going to heat up and kind of break off and it's going to, you know, break off into the combustion exhaust flow. And it's essentially gonna carry out all the energy with it. So imagine you have like a, a thin layer on the inside of the nozzle. And so like particles of that will heat up and then after they heat up, it'll break off. And then all the energy that was absorbed by that then gets carried out with the exhaust flow instead of going into the walls of the chamber. I don't know, Arun, do you have a better explanation than that? That's kind of. That seems solid. Yeah. Um, so that was used by the Methalox engine. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's about all I have to say about that. Um, yeah, we hot fired the Methalox engine with ablative cooling and it, it worked. Kind of. Um, it's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, it, uh, for methylox, it was more of a kind of graphite like coating that would break off in, in fine little particles. Um, but yeah, essentially that to answer your question, Carrie. Um, let's see. So then the last major way to cool um, the entire engine is regenerative cooling, which is where, or I guess you could also do this with a water um, coolant jacket, but uh, for flight, um, having water coolant is very heavy. So uh, what you end up doing is you actually use your fuel to cool the engine. Um, so from the propellant tank, you, you pipe in your fuel and bring it through a heat exchanger that looks like the one in the picture on the right. Um, it goes up the nozzle, um, up towards the injector, and, and that's how you cool the engine. And there's a lot of math that has to be done on sizing the cooling channels and all of that. And um, that is what I've been working on with Arun for Regen. Um, I've spent almost two years working on getting all that complicated math all right. And uh, yeah, so that's that's regenerative. Regenerative is also how most um, large rockets that you see are cooled. Um, you know, like the Saturn V, the F1 engines on that were all um, regeneratively cooled with their kerosene. 
Um, and then the last type of cooling is uh, not really a, a way you can cool the entire engine with. Um, it's kind of just a supplemental cooling technique. Uh, it's called film cooling. Uh, a lot of times people will use it on the injector face or, or like hot spots in the nozzle just to get a little bit extra from it. And basically it's where you have a surface and it's full of very tiny little holes where a little bit of fuel or oxidizer or whatever um, can kind of seep out of those holes and right on the surface there, it'll vaporize. And that kind of forms an insulating layer, um, an insulating film, if you will, of uh, uh, fuel or oxidizer or whatever as it's being um, vaporized to kind of insulate from the actual combustion gases. All right, does anyone have any questions on any of these cooling methods? All right. Okay, so now we're gonna circle back to the uh, different types of heat transfers. Um, so basically in the uh, rocket engine, as I mentioned, the, the two major types are convection and conduction. So I'm gonna talk about those two. So first we have uh, convection. So this is where the combustion gases are you know, flowing really fast over the um, walls of the, of the combustion chamber and nozzle. And uh, the combustion gas is much hotter than the walls of the uh, chamber and nozzle, or at least I would hope they are. Otherwise it would, uh, your nozzle would melt. Um, so convection is, uh, can be described mathematically by Newton's law of cooling which is basically the heat flux, so heat transfer rate per unit area um, is given by H, the heat transfer coefficient, times the, uh, the difference in temperature between the surface and the fluid. Um, so pretty simple. And then um, H, uh, again, is the convective heat transfer coefficient. The units for that are watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, and it's basically just a characterization of the amount of heat that the uh, fluid will either give to a surface or take away from the surface, depending on which one's hotter um, for a, a given temperature difference. Uh, and H is actually kind of complicated to find, um, as you'll see in the next slide. It's, it's calculated based on a lot of different properties of the fluid that you have and the flow characteristics. Um, and yeah, I think I'm just gonna leave it at that and then we'll go on to the next slide. Is there any questions about uh, Newton's law of cooling and heat transfer coefficient? All right, cool. So uh, for combustion, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can find H, but someone at NASA spent a lot of time experimentally finding an equation uh, for the heat transfer coefficient specific to uh, rocket engines and rocket nozzles. Um, oops. So it's a very complicated equation uh, only part of it is shown in the picture below, but that's fine. Arun and I have made a, uh, a calculator that will um, do this for you. It asks for all the values that you need from CEA and your math, and then it spits out this guy. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is only part of the equation. Um, so this screenshot I took from the textbook, Huzel and Huang, um, those are the authors. I don't actually know what the title is, uh, but that's in the resources folder if you actually want to look at it in the textbook. Um, I also have uh, the entire equation here or every part of the equation in the backup slides for this presentation if you want to see it. Um, this is also called the Bartz equation or Bartz approximation for heat transfer coefficient. Um, so yeah, very, very complicated. Lots of variables, but I 
again, we made a, an Excel sheet that defines what all these variables are and asks for everything that it needs. And then we'll calculate your thing. And I'll show you guys that at the end of this presentation. Um, so another thing to note is that, um, so when you have combustion, especially if you're not quite at stoichiometric, like I'm sure a lot of us aren't um, after finding the most efficient combustion uh, or OF ratios, um, you can have soot deposits uh, build up on the walls of the chamber and nozzle. And um, that happens, it's very well characterized for kerosene LOX combustion um, that uh, Huizlin Huang has a, thing, a section on that um, if you're interested and you have uh, kerosene locks. Um, TIOS is an additive. Uh, it's a silicon-based additive that's soluble in alcohol and um, it will basically insulate the nozzle with a layer of glass, uh, which helps a lot. Um, with bringing down the uh, amount of heat transfer into the walls. And basically this is one of the reasons that you don't necessarily want to burn stoichiometric or even the highest specific impulse um, for OF ratio. I know for regen, we're burning quite a ways uh, fuel rich um, than is actually most efficient. And that will number one, bring down combustion temperature, and number two, it's creating a lot of soot deposits that's uh, insulating our, our uh, nozzle. But um, again, this is, if you are interested in looking at the Hu and Huang um, section on this, it's in the resources folder. Otherwise, don't worry about it. We're just gonna use the uh, Excel script uh, sheet uh, that Arun and I made and not worry about these soot deposits. All right. Uh, so now that we've found or know how to find the um, heat transfer coefficient and convective heat transfer into the uh, combustion chamber walls and nozzle walls, uh, those walls are going to conduct heat throughout them. So conduction is generally described mathematically by Fourier's law, which is shown here. So the um, Q double prime heat transfer rate per unit area um, is equal to K, which is a, a property, a material property called thermal conductivity uh, times the difference in temperature uh, over uh, the length that that temperature difference is over. Um, so this is the equation for steady state uh, assumed to be a, an infinite wall of, of thickness X. And if you plug in your heat transfer rate and uh, you know the material uh, thermal conductivity and you know the thickness, you can find uh, the temperature difference. Or if you know the temperature difference, you can find thickness. Um, so yeah, this is for steady state. Once it's reached um, a certain time t, and um, but before that, the um, temperature profile is going to be different. So let me draw. So assuming you have a wall of thickness, whatever x. Uh, and you have the convective heat transfer that we just found on this side. Uh, basically, it's going to start, I'm just going to use yellow for this. So you start at a certain temperature. And after a long time, oops, after a long time, you'll get a linear temperature profile similar to this, where you have T hot. T cold, and that's described by this equation. But before you get to that, and this is where the, the heat sink engine comes in, the maximum firing time. Uh, before that, you have a period where the temperature profile looks like this. 
where over here you have some temperature that's less than T hot here. And over here you still have cold temperature. And for a certain amount of length, this temperature is the same as the initial temperature. Um, I don't know, Ford. I'm teaching a class. Sorry about that again. Ford is distracting me. So before you reach steady state, the temperature profile looks something like this. And basically, you can split it up into two regions um, about here. One where you can approximate as a straight line with the same slope as this, pretend they're parallel. I'm bad at drawing. And then the rest is at this temperature. So we can actually solve for this distance is also going to be x. I'm sorry about that. Um, and that is going to be described by this equation. So this green x is going to be described by the square root of thermal conductivity times the amount of time that's passed over uh, material, the solid material density times its specific heat. Um, yeah. Sorry, that might have been a bit confusing and Ford distracted me halfway through. So are there any questions about, about this? And it's okay if you have no context for, for this. I'm about to go through an example of how to uh, actually use these in, in the heat sink engine. All right, I'll take that as no questions. And I'm gonna to have to erase all of this. Where the, there it is, eraser. Okay. Um, and here's actually where I'm gonna exit the PowerPoint and how do I do that? Okay. Um, so first, uh, you're going to use the Bart's approximation from this slide uh, to find H. Um, generally, also, we're going to focus on the nozzle throat. That's where uh, heat transfer coefficient is going to be the greatest. And that's where that's basically going to be the critical region um, that you're going to look at. It's where it's going to heat up the fastest and all that. Um, so to find H, again, Arun and I made this nifty spreadsheet. No, sorry, someone else is <laughs> asking me a question. Um, all right, so Arun and I made this uh, spreadsheet that will calculate H for you, given that equation. And it asks for all of these inputs that you can find either um, from stuff that you calculated or from the CEA itself. Um, and I'm actually gonna go through the example from uh, the engine Arun and I did over the summer. Yeah. Mm, uh, so first it asked for throat diameter, which we calculated is, Point oh oh nine eight times two. And then it asks for the molar mass of combustion gases at the chamber, which can be found from CEA. So we open up CEA. Uh, so molar mass is this row right here. It it looks weird because it's literally just an M and there's a one over N. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I think that's supposed to be one over N is in number of moles. I don't know, but this is molar mass. Um, I, I checked for region doing it out by hand and the molar mass was this. So you're gonna take this chamber molar mass right here and stick that. I actually didn't look at what the value was, 22.1. Combustion temperature, uh, 
Oh, I don't think we took that up yet, but that is also in CEA right here, 3848. 38. Uh, specific heat in the of the combustion gases in the chamber is CP. Uh, so another thing to note here for units, CEA gives you this value in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, for this equation, you need to convert it to joules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, so just take what CEA gives you and multiply it by a thousand. Interesting, that's a very high specific heat. 7,228. Uh, so gamma, uh, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, I'm used to seeing with Regen, it was around 2000 something. And um, this engine uses, uh, what is it? Uh, ethanol. And I think it's actually cut with water to be um, close to the same ethanol content as Everclear because we were memeing back then. But um, yeah, so it, it probably is the water vapor that's in there. Um, uh, yeah, so gamma is the um, specific heat ratio. Um, CEA also gives us that. Gamma is right here. So for us, that's 1.14. Chamber pressure. Well, again, make sure check units. This is in Pascals. So, gonna copy that. Oops. Um, C star is next, which also comes from the CEA. That's this guy. I don't actually know what C star is, but 1892. And so, so these are all fixed values. Um, and then these two values are specific to whatever section of the nozzle is being analyzed. So if you're looking at for the heat transfer coefficient in the combustion chamber, um, you'll put in the cross-sectional area of your uh, combustion chamber and the uh, Mach number in the combustion chamber. If you're doing it at the throat, Mach number is gonna be one. This is gonna be area of throat. Uh, if you're doing it at the nozzle exit or any section of the nozzle, this is just the cross-sectional area of that section of the nozzle and the Mach number in that section of the nozzle. Um, so again, as I said, we're going to focus mostly on the throat since that's where this is going to be greatest and the uh, uh, nozzle wall is going to heat up the fastest. So going to take the Throat radius is 0 0.00. I'm just going to call that 0 0.01. And 0 0.01 squared times pi. And then again at the throat, we know the Mach number is 1, uh, since that's where it equals the speed of sound flows choked. So, that gives us uh, all of these intermediate stuff that we don't need to worry about, but also our heat transfer coefficient, which is very large. Um, 18,000, 18 kilowatts per meter squared per Kelvin. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the PowerPoint now that we have that. Where's is there a present tab? No. Uh, uh. 
Okay. Oh. Um, so now uh, we have H. Um, we have a combustion temperature. Um, so what we don't have right now is the wall temperature, which is something escape again. Uh, that's going to depend on whatever material you use. And actually Arun also has just now gone through and made a kind of database of materials that we can or can't um, use for the engines, uh, just common materials that are used for rocket engines. Um, and all of their material properties. So, and also uh, he specced out a rough temperature limit. So that's where we can get that from. So yeah, the um, max or the wall temp that we use now for the conduction or the convection part uh, is going to depend on your material. Uh, and I'll get to material selection later. It's um, basically, you're just going to iterate through and find which material works best. But um, so H uh, and temperatures to calculate Q double prime. Yeah, so just use this equation is pretty simple. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and put this stuff in the bottom of this spreadsheet here so you can see. So um, Q double prime at throat. Um, just going to leave that like that. So equals, what did we have? 18,240, 18, times, all right, I'm just going to pick a random material for now. I'm going to go with Inconel 718. Uh, is there any particular reason? No, actually, no, I'm going to go with aluminum 6061. Arun and I were arguing about this yesterday, whether it's a good material to use. And I think it is, and Arun thinks it isn't. So I'm going to use it, 200C. That seems fake, Arun, but um, regardless. Uh, so that's in C. We want to do everything, at least keep the units consistent so our combustion temperature is in Kelvin. Uh, I think it was what, 3848. Yeah, 3848 Kelvin. Uh, so we're gonna need to keep the wall temperature uh, in Kelvin. Uh, Arun put this here in Celsius. Uh, he might change it later. I might make him change it later. But for now, I got to add 293 to that. So 200 plus 293 equals our heat flux in watts per meter square. Again, a very large heat flux. This is on the order of what, 61,000 kilowatts, 61 megawatts. Yeah, that's that's a lot of heat. All right, so once we've done that. Ah, yes, good, good catch. I'm dumb, 293 is what room temperature is, or 298 is what room temperature is. I don't know why I said 293. It should be 273, thank you. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so now we have, so we now we have heat flux across the wall. Um, so heat flux is going to be uh, conserved here. So whatever the heat flux from, uh, or whatever the co convection heat flux is, is gonna equal the conductive heat flux Ah, Q prime. Um, I don't know if everyone saw that because I think Avi is messaging me privately. 
by accident. But um, so Avi asks, if Q double prime is heat flux, what is Q single prime? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I don't think we actually cover what Q single prime is in, or at least we don't really use it that often in heat transfer in our curriculum. But um, essentially it's per a single, yeah, it's per a single unit length. So uh, Q, lowercase Q is just Watts. Uh, Q single prime would be uh, Watts per meter. And then Q double prime is Watts per um, meter squared. Um, actually, that's a good question. Cause I did in doing the calcs for regen, I did find um, there, there's a bit more to uh, the conduction math when you're doing a, a regenerative cooled. Uh, so for that, I had to convert to the heat transfer rate per unit length of combustion chamber. And, and that was essentially a Q single prime. Uh, and that was in the units watts per meter, as in watts per meter of combustion chamber. So yes, where were we? Ah, uh, yes, so Q double prime is conserved across uh, convection and conduction. Uh, so now if we go back here, uh, we know Q double prime, uh, K, is a material property that is in the in here what is it for aluminum 167 uh, we know what the max wall temperature is t hot is the max wall temperature uh, that we just put in for the convective side and t cold is for us, uh, we're gonna make it the initial temperature. Basically, um, uh, yes. Basically what we're gonna solve for, or what we are solving for here is, so you have the wall and, uh, you know, we had the different, at different times, you can find the uh, distance that's, essentially been started to be heated. Um, and we're essentially just gonna find the time it takes for the outside wall to start getting heated if we know the initial temperature and we know the maximum wall temperature. Um, so we're gonna find this thickness and the time it takes for the uh, temperature profile to reach this, if that makes sense to everyone. Now, let's see if I can erase that. Okay. So, yes, where were we? Um, oh, yeah. So, again, yeah, uh, with that in mind, for the conduction side, we're going to use TH as the maximum wall temperature, and T cold is going to be the uh, starting temperature or essentially room temperature. So, uh, and then yeah, oh, and then we're solving for x, which is the the thickness that um, that temperature gradient would be present over. So, uh, wall thickness. Um, I'm going to use it. Actually, I'm not going to use that because that's going to be our variable for time. I'm just going to leave that as x. So if we rearrange this equation, uh, basically just multiply x over, divide q double prime over. So it's going to be k over the heat flux we just found uh, times the temperature difference. So. Um, now we look to this spreadsheet, K was 167 divided by this. This is gonna be times, uh, uh, yes, we had to add 
200 plus 273 this time, not being done, uh, minus 298. Uh, this is going to be a very small. Ah, yes. Yes. Um, this is just an example. Um, this would be where you would say, ah, this is very small. Um, I might want to choose a different material. Um, or just allow it to get a lot hotter, uh, which I'll, I'll do later. Um, so that's in meters. So that's divided by a thousand, half a millimeter is probably unrealistic. Um, so yeah, probably don't use aluminum then or play with your uh, combustion OF ratio and uh, bring down the uh, chamber temperature. But anyway, uh, so now that we've solved for that wall thickness, yeah, so that's where the inside is the maximum, the, the inside wall is gonna be the maximum temperature uh, of the material and the outside is going to be room temperature still. Um, so now we can use this equation to uh, approximate how long it takes for um, the temperature profile to reach the, um, or basically for the inside wall temperature to reach the maximum allowable. So if we rearrange that, it ends up being x squared times rho times Cp over k equals time. And all of these variables are material properties, thermal conductivity, density, specific heat um, of the metal material that we're using. And Arun has all of that in here. So, um, also, yes, uh, the time that we're going to solve for here, uh, where it reaches the maximum allowable is, um, as you would might expect, is going to be the maximum allowable firing time, uh, since that's when it reaches the maximum temperature that we're going to allow. So equals this value squared times density of aluminum 2700 times the specific heat of aluminum Eight ninety six and divided by thermal conductivity one sixty seven. And that is in seconds. Um, yeah, so that is a very short firing time. Um, probably not feasible to make this out of aluminum. Um, but yeah, uh, increasing the uh, allowable temperature um, by 800 C will make a huge impact on that. Um, another, I mean, all of these material properties are gonna impact that. So the higher the allowable temperature, the longer you'll be able to fire. Um, the higher the thermal conductivity, the longer you'll be able to fire. So titanium is probably also not a good choice. Um, the higher the density and the higher the heat capacity, I believe will also result in longer firing times. Uh, so if you were to say use Inconel 625, um, that might get you something that's reasonable for this. Um, 
and hopefully everyone does get something reasonable for this. Um, I think I tested this out on Regen and it came out to something reasonable, although we are using a very fuel rich mixture that results in uh, very low combustion temperatures. If you remember this engine, the, the example we just used is at almost 4,000 Kelvin uh, regions. Uh, chamber temperature is like 2,800 Kelvin, significantly lower. So that'll help with a longer firing time. Um, regen, we're also we're using Inconel 625. Um, so yeah, just about out of time. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to iterate on that again, but yeah, play around with this. I know this lecture was a lot to absorb at once, especially for those freshmen who haven't taken thermo or fluids yet. This is a lot of new formulas and variables and material properties and stuff. So don't worry too much about this heat transfer stuff. Um, everything after um, this lecture is going to be, I don't want to say optional, but kind of just like go at your own pace. If you get something, if you get something reasonable for this, great. If you don't get something reasonable for this, don't worry. As long as you get something, as long as you, um, you know, look through the resources and, and followed these steps uh, and picked the material and stuff. Uh, that's great. Um, so yeah. And Jackson. Yeah. Uh, did you already talk about what what magnitude uh, like a reasonable firing time would be? Ah uh, yes. Um, so. I think the uh, IPA Gox engine fired for five seconds, although I don't know that they actually did any math on that. I think they literally just said, this is a giant hunk of metal. It won't explode if it gets really hot. And I think they called it a day. Um, so yeah, five seconds to 10 seconds. I don't remember exactly what I got when I was doing this with Regen. I want to say it was something on the order of like, I think it was on the order of like five seconds as well. I think it was a little bit less than that. Um, so yeah, all of those would be reasonable times, as long as it's something that you can actually like see with your own eyes. Um, anything less than a second is probably not reasonable or anything that you can, you know, actually get a reasonable force measurement from. Uh, I think that's, I feel like there was something else I wanted to say. Um, but while I think about that, um, just so everyone is aware of the schedule going forward. So this week we did cooling. Oh my God, the stupid bar is getting in the way. Uh, so this week we did cooling on Thursday. So we're actually switching the days that were doing the lectures and the breakout sessions. Um, hopefully everyone can make uh, both of those. Um, so Tuesday, we'll do the uh, breakout sessions where you'll, you'll do the uh, cooling math. And then next Thursday, we'll do the lesson on the uh, injector. And then the next Tuesday after that, which is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, is going to be a kind of semi-optional um, breakout session to work on injector math. Um, injector is kind of complicated. It's very fluids heavy. Um, so that might be a bit challenging for freshmen as well. But um, again, the uh, breakout session for that is going to be the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, which I know I'm probably going to be home for. Uh, so that'll be semi-optional. And uh, after that, once we get back from Thanksgiving, we'll do, um, we have three different parts of all the big scary theory behind um, how rocket engines work. 
And, and that was one of the things that was most requested over the summer. Um, so I just figured I'll show it to all you guys, even though it'll probably go over uh, your heads. Um, it would be cool to just, you know, sit in and, and absorb as much as you can. We're not going to do any math uh, based on the actual theory of what's going on. It's literally just going to be, a, hey, here's a really cool um, lecture about what's actually happening inside these rocket engines, just um, so you guys know what's going on there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're almost done. Um, so again, next Tuesday, we're going to do breakout sessions for uh, all this cooling math that we just did. Uh, and then we're going to have injector and then breakout sessions on injector. Um, these two weeks, again, are, are, we're getting more and more complicated. So don't worry if you don't understand everything or get a result that uh, seems really wacky and unreasonable. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, as long as you've, you know, gotten up to here, that'll be cool. And also work with Arun um, at the beginning of this. I think we said we'd try to uh, 3D print a, a scaled down uh, model of the engines that you guys have made for everyone. So I'll talk to Arun about setting up the logistics of that and get those printed um, before finals. So with that, uh, we're basically out of time, but does anyone have any questions about uh, today's lecture, about going forward, about anything really? If not, you guys can go ahead and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thank you. Arun, how do I stop recording? Did it, it didn't stop recording when I, oh.